It's Thursday, and it's time to do some UFC predictions, talk about the news as it's happening, vis-a-vis MMA, and uh, yeah, that's about all that I got for the intro here. Uh, Let's talk about the news here. UFC Charlotte had payouts, actually. We have fighter pay documentation, uh, because North Carolina is a athletic commission that actually um, requires the, um, the publication of uh, fighter pay stuff, which the UFC has worked to pressure a number of commissions not to do, which is the classic remove, uh, remove the uh, fighter leverage and also uh, allow UFC boat lookers to claim, no, 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 UFC fighters make a ton of money and, and, and they don't. We, we know they don't because we, we know in the overall sense of things uh, vis-a-vis the, um, the financial documentation of the UFC, uh, well, specifically Endeavor, that um, no, they, they do not make a lot. Um, I am going to say some nice things, though, here about fighter pay for a hot second. One, it looks like they have finally fixed the whole concept of the UFC uh, Ultimate Fighter contract being crap for the winner uh those who do not know way back in the day way back in the day we're talking like season one season two season three the ufc would trumpet the ultimate fighter contract is this great thing six figure contract ridiculous contract it's amazing uh in in actuality it was like a incredibly underpaying contract that just happened to be really really long like it was worth six figures in the sense that um I will make a million dollars over the course of my life. Everyone will. <laughs> Just working a regular job, you'll you'll eventually get there. Um, it was that kind of deal. And uh, Brian Battle, a uh, tough winner, is making 50 and 50. Uh, he made 100K for his win, his incredible knockout over um, Gabe Green. So it looks like that has finally shifted and moved on. And that's cool. That's awesome. I am here to crap on the UFC when the UFC deserves crap. And I will praise the UFC when it deserves it. Because honestly, Tough has stopped actually being a great producer of like stars or anything. And they have finally bumped the pay up. Go figure. Um, Also, Alex Morono made surprisingly decent money. Uh, 90K and 90K, I do believe it was what it was. I think 100K got reported a couple places. But yeah, I've got Via Sure Dog as well as via MMA Junkie, we have 90 and 90. Um, so, you know, 100, 180K there. Surprisingly low paydays. Court McGee only making 60 grand is a little bit weird because he is a tough winner. Um, I mean, for, for, for argument's sake, he's a tough winner who's making 10 grand more than a very recent tough winner. And a guy who's achieved, a, you know, never a title contender or anything, never even like a ranked top 10 fighter, but like, you know, a thing. And uh, top paid guy, base pay on the card was Anthony Smith at 200K. Which, by the way, comes in kind of handy here because we have Francis Ngannou signing with the PFL. Now, this is interesting because uh, we don't actually have a figure for pay. I've seen people banding around like $30 million as the contract worth for Francis. Um, I don't think that's the case because uh, I, I, I thought, I could have sworn... Uh, in Francis, in Francis's statement in the PFL statement, <clears throat> the salary was for high seven figures per fight, and it's only three fights long. So even if it's like nine million dollars, that'd be seven figures. That'd only be about twenty-seven million. Now there there's some other things there. There's a signing bonus. There's a position as uh, PFL's African ambassador, which I assume pays something. And uh, there's also a split in the revenue. So it'll probably be worth like you know it'll be worth a lot. It'll be worth billions, assuming you know. PFL doesn't go bankrupt. But the most interesting thing here is that in the contract, Francis Ngannou demands $2 million payday for his opponents. So for comparison purposes, if you go to PFL and you fight Francis Ngannou, you'll make $2 million. Now, you'll you'll also probably suffer CTE, but you'll make $2 million. The highest uh, guy on this card was 200000 that being Anthony Smith, a former UFC title contender. So any idea that like, you know, Francis missed the bag. I keep seeing that. Like there are people who are like, well, no, he would have, uh, he would have made 30 million with the UFC easily. 
here's the problem. The UFC and Francis haven't have, have more or less agreed on the amount that it was Brock Lesnar money, which we know to be about $8 million. So you're telling me that the UFC walked away from the table. Well, or Francis did. Or let, let's put it this way. The UFC didn't go above $8 million during the negotiations with Francis and Ghana. But they would have given him $30 million magically now. And of course, there's also this weird ass logic that like the UFC is a great business organization. And it is. I actually agree with that. But they're a great business organization who would have paid multiple millions of dollars for a guy that is not a draw per the UFC bootlickers. Um, what, I, what I'm getting at at the end here is it's a big win for Francis. He has the door open for boxing. Supposedly he's going to box this year. Make his PFL debut in 2024. Will you know? Could this fall apart? Sure, the PFL could go bankrupt. They are spending a lot of money, uh, which does have me a little bit worried. Where is that money coming from? Because uh, whatever. They're also talking about acquiring Bellator, so they must have a big pile of liquid cash that they're sitting on, and it's probably better not to speculate where it's from. But anyways, that's it for Francis. He got the bag. He got the big win. He got a lot of what he wanted. He got a lot of what his public demands of the UFC were. And now, of course, we have the great debate of whether he or John Jones is the most dangerous man on the planet and the best fighter in the world. And to be clear, I have no problem if your take is that John Jones is the best fighter in the world. But can we please stop using the Cyril God fights as a reference for that? Nganu fought uh, Gone with one leg. John Jones, as far as we know, was fully healthy against Cyril Gaon. And it's just a ridiculously different stylistic matchup. Uh, you know, um, Gaon is an easier fight for Jones. Not because Jones is necessarily better. He might be. You could, you could take that thought. But because the stylistic matchup of Gaon being incapable of wrestling <laughs> and anyone incapable of wrestling is going to lose to John Jones. Um you know, is is the defining moment of that fight. Like, style, styles make fights, and that's all there is to it. Let's move on to the UFC. Ah, damn it, where is this card anyways? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Are we back? Yeah, we're back in Vegas. We're back at the Apex. I should have known, because it's Angela Hill versus uh, Mackenzie Dern, who I think even by... Let me check the UFC rankings here. I've seen some... Uh, the points that this is a main event that doesn't have a top 10 fighter in it women's straw weight please Dern's number eight okay so that that is wrong um Dern's eight Hill's 14 um and you can't really argue that Dern should actually be eighth because like the top 10 is rounded up by Tisha Torres and the Yet to actually fight at strawweight since returning Tatiana Suarez. So, you know, there is that. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe you could argue a bad I had to burp. Anyways, um, burp is achieved. Whew, this fight card. Um, the main card is not bad, actually. There's a solid amount of depth. I am looking forward to Edmund Chabazian, Anthony Hernandez. I am looking forward to Emily Dakota versus Lupi Godinez. I am looking forward to the welterweight debut of Joaquin Buckley versus Andre Fialo. And I'm kind of looking forward to Michael Johnson, Carlos Diego Fajaya, although that fight could be terrible. Uh, we'll get into the specifics of that, but that fight could just honestly be quite terrible. Um, and that's the main card along with the main event. But the undercard is not great there's not there's a lot of fights here that just kind of make me sad like Carolina Kovalkovich versus Vanessa Adopoulos feels like a fight that Kovalkovich should like you know be able to show off her stuff but at this point do I have any faith that Kovalkovich yeah on a two-fight winning streak to be clear but at 37 years old really has much left in the tank no I honestly expected her to be you know retired before this why is Demopolis listed out of fight-ready MMA, boarding a nationality of Greece, fighting out of Denver, Colorado? That's very bizarre, because that's a Scottsdale, Arizona gym. Anyways, continuing on down. Um, 
Orion Koshi versus Gilbert Arbina does not feel like a UFC fight. Ilar Latifi feels like he should be retired. He did retire. He's back. It's never great when a fighter retires and comes back. Nick Fiore doesn't feel like UFC material. I have no idea what they're doing with Natalia Silva. Takeshi Sato versus Themba Garimbo is, again, a fight that does not feel like UFC caliber. So the main, the undercard stinks. And to be honest, doesn't even like have high like action ratings. Like I could see Chase Hooper, Nick Fiore being an okay fight. I could see Koshi versus Urbina being kind of like a high grade regional fight, maybe. Um, Natalia Silva may do something cool. And uh, Mahashate versus Borshev. I don't know, that has some promise, but like, that's it. Kovalkovic Demopoulos, I think, is objectively going to be kind of a shitty fight. Latifi versus Nashimento, I think, is going to be kind of a shitty fight. Sato versus Garimbo is going to be kind of a shitty fight. Um, so, yeah, the undercard, not wowing me. Um, card lost some things, obviously, like Irene Aldana versus Raquel Pennington was supposed to be the uh, main event. Aldana ending up with a title shot instead. Um, Razak Al Hassan, Bruno Fajaya was supposed to be on this card. That actually would have been pretty fun. I mean, those are like two tremendously limited fighters, but like a fun fight. Clayton Carpenter was supposed to be on the card against Steve Urseg. Why do I recognize Steve Urseg's name? Uh, oh yeah, he's an um, Australian guy. Has a win. Has kind of a his big win is over Shannon Ross, uh, but he does have promise. So you know, there you go. But that fight apparently fell apart as well. Um, I will say that the, uh, Pollyanna Viana pulling out of her fight with Emily Dakota has given us a better fight, uh, with Lupe, Lupe Godina stepping in. Uh, I appreciate that, I guess. But yeah, decent main card, not a great main event, crappy undercard. It's a fight night. Let's get into it. Uh, Mackenzie Dern versus Angela Hill. Um, man, this is a two true outcome fight. Uh, as is the case with like pretty much any fight you put Mackenzie Dern in because she is incredibly one dimensional. She is an amazing grappler. I fully put that up, put put that forth. Um, but she has no real wrestling game and no real stand up game to work on that. Like there was that kind of like brief moment of light at the end of the tunnel when she fought Verna Genderoba, and we're like, ah, oh, she's putting some striking together. It has not gotten better and has actually regressed after that. That was really more about Genderoba not being able to really strike at all. And Angela Hill really should be a safe pick here when you think about it. Like Angela Hill, super well-rounded person. You know, if you had to describe her with an archetype, it was kick, it's a kickboxer. Should be able to play at range. Decent footwork. Decent athleticism, despite, you know, getting up there in age. Seems like she has not regressed at all as an athlete. But at the same time, doesn't have a way to deny an aspect of the game. We saw this in her fight with Verna Jandaroba, actually, throwing you know that in there, where Verna was able... Verna had needed clinch to win the fight, and Hill had no way to deny the clinch to Verna because Angela Hill fights in a way that is not... Um, afraid is a clumsy word, but I'm going to use it. Is not afraid to go and combat the A game of the opponent... Her game, her game is not based on evading those exchanges. There you go. It's not like she, you know, won't defend a takedown or anything. Like she'll defend a takedown, but like her general strategy does not avoid the pocket range clinch, whatever it happens to be. Like she will, she wants to fight all terrain essentially. She wants to do all of the things, and that means that she'll give Dern clinch opportunities to try to drag her to the ground. Now the question is, can she do that? On top of this, Dern is going through, I believe, a divorce. Uh, Wikipedia said um, separation, but I believe a divorce. She's had a messy camp. She's apparently changed a lot of her coaching around and whatever. Going away from Jason Perillo uh, is my understanding. If I'm wrong on that, please, you know, correct me in the comments on YouTube or, you know, however you want, Discord. Uh, works best. Discord does work best. Um, but that's a lot of ca chaos as well. And it suggests that I don't suspect she'll be better. I if anything, she'll be worse than what she's been. 
And that's why I am going to go with Hill by decision. She hasn't scored a finish since 2020, and that was against Hannah Seifers. So, you know, not a finisher. Not a big puncher. Dern is pretty tough. Dern is actually uh, pretty durable uh, for a BJJ fighter. Stays composed and whatever. But I just... <sighs> I, I'm nervous about it because there is going to be every opportunity for Dern to just, like that, get a takedown, get a scramble, get a dominant position, get a sub. Like, she has that scary level of grappling. And we have a striker who does not avoid entries for that. Uh, but I am going to go with Hill by decision. I just think that she's probably in a better place right now, mentally, probably even physically, and is settled in for, you know, a coaching uh, with a coaching staff and whatever. And it just seems a bit weird uh, to be changing up your camp. And it just seems like there's too much chaos going on in Mackenzie Dern's life. Uh, Hill is the slight underdog at plus 144 to plus 150. Not surprised. Dern always has a lot of love, a lot of simping, let's be honest. Um, but a lot of hype. You know, she's a name that has casual uh, ring to it. And her minus 170 to minus 190 favorite status, not surprising. Edmund Shabazian versus Anthony Hernandez. This is my main event because... I am I'm 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 interested in both guys. I'm I'm invested in both of these middleweights. Uh Shabazian is someone I could see as a champion. Like I, I'm not kidding. Like the base physical skills he has, the aggression he has, the confidence he can have are all ingredients of like a championship level fighter. But at least during his time with uh, Tarvinian and the Ronda Rousey crew over at Glendale, there was the fact that anytime he ran into real pushback, real bad moments, he would find way he would find ways to make it worse and then eventually get out of the fight. Essentially, and he didn't do that against Dolce Lunjumbula, which is his first fight under the Extreme Couture banner. Better gym, high quality coaching. Hopefully they'll, you know, undo a lot of the damage Glendale has done and make things happen. But at the same time, Dolce Lujumbula is a quite low-end UFC middleweight. You know, athletic, powerful, dynamic, threatening, dangerous, but not someone who tends to come up with prolonged solutions and resistance to what you're doing. So it was kind of like the Shabazian wins of the past. So has that mental aspect really been fixed? That is going to let this guy go forth and kind of do his sort of bully striking power based game. I don't know. And in Anthony Hernandez, you have someone who is very hard to break and very good at breaking people. He's very good at providing that sense of resistance which Shabazian rumbled for, before uh, from. And that's why I'm going with Anthony Hernandez to pull off like a submission. He's not necessarily a big finisher. Like he really likes... He, Hernandez's idea is like, I'm going to break you before I actually finish you. And in 15 minutes, usually the opponent's not broken enough for him to just like go for the submission. But like if Shabazian starts breaking... I kind of feel like the walls come tumbling down. Like he's full on uh, <laughs> the walls of Jericho uh, on this one. It won't take much. Um, so yeah, I, I've I've got to go with Hernandez. He's a bigger favorite than I expected at minus 191 to minus 250. And Edmund is a plus 165 to plus 200 underdog. Again, I do feel the need to say this. Do not bet what you cannot lose. Do not expect to make money off of betting on UFC because it's really, really hard. There's a lot of variables in this sport. A lot of things could go... Like, Edmund Shabazzian could come out here and after having trained with Extreme Couture for... I don't know how long. Because I don't know how long he was there before the Luchimbula fight. But half a year? Better than half a year? It's, it's at least been six months. Because he hasn't fought in six months. But it's presumably been like, you know... The better part of a year. 
and that may see him just completely be uh, be a new man, like a lot of things being fixed, and just go on from there. So I've got Hernandez. Shabazian might be worth a bet if you're looking for an underdog to bet on. Same with Angela Hill. Um, but do not do not do any of this stupid thirty thousand betting shit. Oh God. Uh, Emily Ducote, Lupe Godinez in a catchweight fight because uh, Godinez is taking this on uh, relatively short notice, I believe. Um, this was supposed to be Pollyanna Viana. Um, Ducote is someone I have not, er, honestly, not really come, uh, come around to. I mean, let's be honest here. I picked Jessica Penne to beat her. And that's that's not a great sign because I don't have a lot of faith in Jessica Penne. Uh, and she, you know, she passed that uh, that task with flying colors, but then she lost to... Uh, Angela Hill. Godinez has also lost to Angela Hill. Godinez also had a really unimpressive outing against Cynthia Calvillo. I do believe it was. Was it Calvillo? Am I thinking of somebody else? Pretty sure it was. Yeah, Cynthia Calvillo, a fight that some people scored for Calvillo. I did not. I thought Godinez won it. But still, split decision against um, against Calvillo in 2023. Not great. Um, the problem with Godinez is she's got a strong wrestling game. She really does. But everything she does is very rigid. It's do A, do B, do C, do D, do E. And if you can interrupt anything in that chain, her game tends to self-destruct a little bit. Now, she was trying some better things against Calvillo, trying to be less rigid. That probably is why that fight was so close. Uh, so it's a work in progress. It might be working down there. And there are some things Dakota can possibly interrupt there. Uh, Dakota is essentially an outside striker who's too short to outside strike. She has to strike in the pocket because she's quite small. Like um, She has 63 inches of reach. That's hard to be an outside fighter, really even, even, even down at straw weight. Um, that's hard to do. So she thrives in the pocket. She thrives off of combination punching. She's a pretty good striker. Actually a reasonably competent uh, counter wrestler and grappler. But um, I kind of see Godina as being the better physical fighter, the fighter who can bring that level of grappling, that level of aggression to the table. And I just don't know what part of Godinez's game Dakota can really interrupt with frequency and make her own. I mean, obviously, the, count, the, the pocket striking would be her best bet. But I think Godinez is also getting to the point where like the pocket striking is not really interrupting what she's doing anymore. Also, like Dakota is going to be in range to go for takedowns to force clinches with. And like that it feels kind of like the Ariane Carnelosi fight. Like Dakota is a more technical version of Carnelosi, but like a way less physical version of Carnelosi. And that was a test that Godinez did pass with flying colors. So I'm going with Loopy by decision. She's a minus 150 to minus 164 favorite. Dakota is a plus 120 to plus 133 underdog. That feels about right. Win bet on that fight. Boom. Uh, Andre Fialo versus Joaquin Buckley. Buckley dropping down to welterweight. Now, I usually I usually say dropping a weight class is actually more of a concern because it's identifying the wrong things. Because almost always it's like someone who's lost a couple of fights and is like, hmm, I'm just not big enough. And like the truth is, not really. Like there are like massive technical problems for you that you know you really should fix, and that is true of Buckley. <laughs> I do want to say that like Buckley has a lot of uh, problems. Uh, really, it's, it's it's um the weird thing is that Buckley will show moment for a couple of moments, anyways. This really sophisticated. Deep technical game that attacks multiple levels, throws in combination, maximizes his physical attributes in a way that makes him an incredibly dangerous fighter. And then you also know he has the flash, you know, he's got the ninja kick knockout, which is, you know, incredible hyper hyperbolic of what his actual ability is. But like he is capable of like having that creative flash flare that can make a fight really, really interesting. And at middleweight, he was a five foot ten guy. So, like, going down here might actually be a good idea. But my major concern with him is still that mental side of things. Because a lot of the time, Buckley would get in trouble because he would just start kind of headhunting. 
and kind of stop being a creative fighter, stop being a guy who gives variability and just everything kind of goes like kill and a very like shallow game. So going to welterweight doesn't fix any of that. This being said, Andre Fialo is a more flawed fighter in the sense that I like the game he's trying to put together. It's a pressure, reasonably high volume, kind of deft counter game. Like ideally, that's what he wants to do. And he and, and he's fairly tall for the division. He's a six foot tall um um welterweight, which is, you know, that's pretty tall. Like, you know, that 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 wouldn't be at a place at like, you know, middleweight. But I don't think he has the inherent confidence to pull it off. There are little hitches to his game that are like him overthinking things and going into things with that lack of confidence, that lack of uh, panache. And um, as a result, he gets really hit really hard. Like this is a guy who went out there with Jake Matthews and after Jake Matthews destroyed him, it was like, my God, Jake Matthews might actually be really a thing here. He might have like turned a corner and then Matt Summelsberger like pissed on those dreams. Um, what I'm saying is that the things that tend to get Fialo knocked out are present in Buckley, the power, the physicality, uh, the ability to be somewhat creative, the ability to be confident, the ability to take pressure and turn it back. And uh, that's why I'm going with Buckley by knockout. So one of those few times where like going down a weight class, at least for now, will be a good idea. And Buckley's a you know reasonably big favorite, minus 210 to minus 230. Fialo plus 172 to plus 190. Now, there is always the caveat, this is a weight cut that he has not done before. So keep an eye on the weigh-in day. Buckley may look like absolute shit. And uh, well, <laughs> any money you committed to him probably should, should wait till then. Uh, Michael Johnson, Carlos Diego Fejea. This is a classic Johnson fight in the sense that Johnson's not that hard to take down. Not that hard. Like, resist it, whatever. He's got good, he's actually got really good boxing for MMA. But he has terrible grappling instincts. This is a guy who got subbed by Paul Sass way back in the day. Like, it's an old fight, but like, it's, it's a recurring theme in his in his career where it's like, I'm winning, I'm winning the stand-up, I'm doing great, I'm on the ground and I don't know what to do. Um, and Carlos Diego Fea has lost three in a row, but like in a way that is not present in the recent wins of Johnson, which are Mark Diacasi and Alan Patrick, is the fact that Carlos Diego Fea's striking actually leads to grappling. He has a melded game, whereas with Patrick, there's no striking game. He just kind of comes forward. And Dia Casey has a striking game, has a wrestling game, but they are not related to each other at all. So it was dead giveaways. Fejea actually has like, there, there was a time when Carlos Diego Fejea was actually like expected to be going places. And he kind of did. I think he achieved a top 10 ranking at one point. But, um... You know, what I'm getting at is he can box into the clinch, into takedown range, into getting his world-class jiu-jitsu on and submit Michael Johnson. We'll see. We haven't seen him in... He hasn't won since 2020. I don't think we've seen him in like a year. Lost three in a row. Getting old. There's a chance that he have just has fallen apart. Uh, and in which case, this will be a sad fight. But, you know, I'm picking him. He is the favorite at minus 150 to minus 167. Johnson is plus 122 to plus 143. You could bet on either of those at those odds, and I think it would probably work. On to the undercard. Mahachete versus Vyacheslav Borshev, a.k.a. Slava Kaz. Um, Mahachete does seem like a really, really powerful guy, like a really physical guy, guy who can wrestle, guy who can strike. Did lose to Rafa Garcia, though. That's a means for co- or that's a cause for concern. Rafa Garcia is not that good. Um, fun fighter. Fun fighter, but not that good. Like he's a he's an action fighter. Uh Borshev. Oh boy. Borshev is bad. Um 
he's good at one dimension of fighting, which is he's actually pretty good at like pocket striking. But that means that the wrestling is right there. And that the fact that he can't wrestle very well, despite being a team alpha male guy, uh, leaves him in perfect range to just get kind of manhandled, bullied, destroyed. I'm picking Mahashete to win a decision. Slava Claus is the favorite at minus 155 to minus 200. Mahashete the dog at 130 to 140. Don't blame it. Mahashete, Mahashete is very unproven. Very, very unproven. But I also think the Slava Claus is also very, very unproven. And what he has proved is that there are some gaping holes in his game. Karolina Kovalkovic versus Vanessa Demopoulos. It's a fight that Kovalkovic should win. Demopoulos is one-dimensional. Has four and a half inches less of reach. Like she has under 60 inch reaches. It's kind of insane. Like I said, 63 inches was like really limiting. Under 60 is incredibly limiting. But Carolina's way to win is still seemingly mostly on the grappling side of things. And while she has found kind of this next life in fighting, it's been against Felice Herrig, a fighter who was as broken as her, if not more, and Silvana Gomez Juarez who was one dimensional in a way and not very good at that dimension, but one dimensional in a way that would allow Carolina to grapple her and was really in the UFC because let's be honest, she was smoking hot. Um, and we like it or not, like it or not, that's how a lot of this goes. Um, I'm taking Demopolis to win a decision here. She's going to get grappling exchanges. She's actually a pretty good grappler. Uh, I'm still, I'm still not at all a big believer in Demopolis, like long term. I just think that there's too much physical limitation there. Um, on a height level, she's not an especially great takedown artist or anything. She, you know, won barely over Jin Yu Fry. She had a competitive fight with Maria Oliveira. That's not great. She did armbar Silvana Gomez Juarez earlier on mentioned, but like, you know, the loss to JJ Aldridge in her debut uh, has always put her at a, like um, a limiting point for me. But she is 3 1 in the UFC. I, I'm predicting her to go four and one, so I don't know. Maybe maybe there is some long term jeopardy here. Uh, she does have a good. She does have a. She has a thing with the whole jumping into the commentator's arms and uh, and just a you know a general confidence, a swagger. A uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the word here. A presence. There you go. That the UFC might want to push, and uh, Kovalkovich is a good skull to give her. So there you go. Uh, I am picking her. She's the underdog at minus uh, plus one ten to plus one thirteen. Let's get there's a very slight under, underdog, but I am I am surprised. Like she's you know she's on a three fights uh, streak. One of those three fights is a finish over a girl that may have arguably beaten Kovalkovic in Silvana Gomez Juarez, and uh, Carolina is the minus one thirty to minus one forty favorite. I don't know. Maybe it's just like you know nostalgia. Kovalkovic has been to a higher is falling from a higher hype than I think Demopolis will ever get to. So, there is that. Orion Koshi and Gilbert Urbina is a fight that can just die in a fire. Um, Urbina is a 6'3 welterweight. That's cool. But he's an uninteresting guy who made it to the tough finals. He's part of the Urbina family that has been, like, constantly on tough. He's just not very good. I, I struggle to even tell you what he is. Is he a wrestler? Is he a kickboxer? Is he a boxer? Is he a jujitsu guy? They're all kind of present, but they're all like he's he's freestyle, not good at anything, and not super athletic. He's just kind of he's just big. Uh, Koshi is and his brother are not interesting fighters to me at all. They're bare bones wrestle boxers. But that's probably enough to win a decision for Koshi. He's the favorite at minus 115 to minus 130. Urbina is plus 102. Uh, actually comes in at minus 105 on uh, on his um, his most off uh, center book uh, betting odds. But I I am I'm not looking forward to this fight. Uh, I'm not at all like this. This is a fight that I would be perfectly happy to be checking out live on a regional show or watching on stream on a regional show. There'd be no shame in it. This is not about the two fighters. 
just about that like if this is a UFC level fight F off like <laughs> that's that's what it comes down to like this is just not even for a UFC undercard this is not good uh, speaking of not good, uh, Elar Latifi versus Rodrigo Nascimento. Now, I am a big fan of Elar Latifi back in the day. The man's presence, the man's gimmick, the man's centaur-like physique always enjoyed me, always get, always enjoyed, always gets a laugh. But uh, he retired after beating Alexei Olenek and fought with like a massive staph infection in his thigh. And now he's back. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? And and like the, the sadder part is I'm inclined to pick him. Nashimento is a slow plotting power striker with by heavyweight standards good jujitsu and good grappling. And being a good grappler is not the way to beat Ilar Latifi at all because the man is a golem who will wrap his arms around your thighs and around your body and throw you around. Even at heavyweight, even though like he's, this is a guy that used to fight at middleweight. Um, Latifi by uninspired decision. And I, but part of me kind of wants Nascimento to, to win. Um, Latifi is an underdog at plus 150 to plus 175. I can't object to that man is coming off a retirement after all. Nascimento is a minus 188 to minus 220 favorite. Sure, I guess. I don't. I don't know. Barely being Tanner Bozer, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't inspire much. And also, like to be honest, having some problems with Alan Bado as a grappler at points in their fight. Nascimento, I don't know. Like he's on a decent run in the UFC. He's uh three uh two and one, and then like I think had. Did he did he beat Bado or did Bado beat him? What was the deal with that? Originally a TKO win for Nashimento, overturned to an to a no contest when he tested positive for uh retallic acid uh metabolite of psycho stimulant drugs, methyl uh methylphetamine and ethyl phenidate. Phenidate? Methylphenidate, ethylphenidate. Hmm. I don't know. I'm I am I'm not an expert with the PED names. Um tested positive for drugs. <laughs> and uh and had that called to a no contest. Um so like he's had a he's had a decent run, but like he also got melted by Daukus and and the three guys that he beat, Dante Mays, Tanner Bozer, and Alan Badeau, are all kind of known as not good wrestlers. Latifi is a good wrestler. I spent too long on this fight. Chase Hooper going up to lightweight apparently to fight Nick Fiore. Uh, Hooper is interestingly three inches taller and two inches longer. So like, you know, he definitely has a frame that suits lightweight, but dude is still very, very skinny. <sighs> I don't know. I've never known what to make of Chase Hooper. Like he'll have these random moments where like, I'm like, oh my God, something's coming out of this. The Felipe Calaros fight was a great example of that where I'm like, Wow, he's uh, he's doing a thing, and I like it. I like where this is going, and there's a physical bully aspect to this from the nerd, and 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 some some things that'll back up the fact that he's kind of like an interesting grappler with very limited striking, a and then it'll fall apart like the next fight. Um, Fiore is generally a grappler. Uh, he's a New England cartel guy, so I assume. He has good striking because that's what that that's what that group is known for. That's that's Calvin Cater, that's uh, Rob Font, educated jab, good range striking, good combinations, comfortable kind of all around. But Fiore seems to like to grapple. He's not particularly good. He feels kind of like a Felipe Calaros. I'm going with Hooper by decision, but uh, I'm I don't know. I'm not I'm not looking forward to the fight because if Hooper wins. I, I, I've given up on the idea that he'll actually be something and it'll just mean Fiore is not good. And if Fiore wins, it also doesn't mean much. Um, I don't, I, I, it just feels like a fight with no, with no good stakes. Shall I say like there are bad stakes here, 
either of these guys losing, it's it's not good for them. It puts them on the verge of being cut. Uh, by the way, the USC, I will say this, though. USC doesn't really cut people. Like, a great example of this is people are making a big deal out of um, three of the fighters on last week's card no longer being with the UFC. Chase Sherman and Jessica Rose Clark were both on the last fight of their contracts. They just fought their contracts out. They weren't cut. Gian Kim, I don't know about. Might have been cut. Whole thing of getting two points deducted and losing a fight to uh, Mandy Boom. Uh, would warrant it. But uh, I think I said, I think I said cut both of them. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if she got cut or if it was the last fighter video. Hooper is the underdog. I am surprised at that. Plus 102 to plus 160. So like not a big underdog. It's minus 122 to minus 143 for Fiore. But Fiore is not one in the UFC. Hooper does have a little bit of like casual fan cachet. I am at a loss to describe this betting line. I am not at a loss to describe Natalia Silva versus Victoria Leonardo's betting line, which is minus 800 to minus 1100 for Silva, plus 500 to plus 700 for Leonardo. I don't get the matchmaking here. I said that at the top of the bill. Um, Natalia Silva debuted against Jasmine Jusudovicius, which was a good debut fight. Like, that was solid. Jusudovicius uh, had, I think, been undefeated at that point. Uh, mind you, when I say undefeated, I mean like 1 0 against. Um, Kay Hansen, and that was it. Uh, I might be, might be wrong. Had she lost? Tell you, Silva. Yeah, yeah. She she was she was one to know in the UFC. She had won her uh, contender series fight against uh, Julia Polestri, not a bad fighter, and then beaten Kay Hansen, and then fought Natalia Silva. So, like you know, an appropriate level of like intro fight for Natalia Silva, and then she fought. Uh, Teresa Bleda, which felt like a very lateral move. Bleda was a newcomer to the UFC. A lot of promise, like a, a big athletic physical specimen, but very shallow on technique. And now she's gone from that to shallow on technique and not an athlete, Victoria Leonardo. I don't get the point of this fight. I have Silva by TKO. She is hard to take down. She has good hips. She has good striking. She has good grappling if need be. Leonardo just is not very good. I, I appreciate Leonardo. There's a lot of hard work to Leonardo. There's a lot to like about Leonardo as a person. But as a UFC caliber fighter, she's a plus 500, plus 700 underdog. <laughs> um, and then uh, Takeshi Sato, Themba Garimbo. Oh, Lord. This... The beginning of this card is... Is a slog. Until we get to like Demopolis versus Kol- Kovalkiewicz, I just I have I have nothing. Um, Garimbo's not good at anything. I want him. I want him to succeed. Dude has had a rough life. I want him to succeed. I want all the good things in the world. I want mixed martial arts to be a transformative force for a guy who has had a really tough life. But he is not good at anything. He got steamrolled by AJ Fletcher. Sato is kind of a sneaky counter striker with kind of a judo game who has lost to anyone that is UFC caliber that he has fought, honestly. Like, let's his UFC run has been as follows getting murdered by Brian Battle, getting decisioned by Gunnar Nelson off the shelf. Getting submitted by Miguel Baeza, knocking out Jason Witt, having a, I guess, remotely competitive fight, I guess, with Bilal Muhammad, getting subbed in the third round back in 2019, and beating the ghost of Ben Saunders. He's two and four, which doesn't sound all that bad, but Witt and Saunders are both guys who struggle badly with durability at the times he fought them. Saunders used to have durability, Witt never did. And just getting worked in three out of his four losses. He had like, he, I I haven't even watched the Bilal Muhammad fight. The only thing I'm noting is that like it got to the third round. So I don't know, maybe there was moments there, but I, I feel like he probably also got uh, steamrolled there. And before getting to the UFC, he had lost to Glyco Franca and Kenta Takagi and beaten. <sighs> Matt Valley had a 10 and one record. I don't know, maybe. 
maybe maybe Matt Valley's okay. Matt Valley. Then, then again, I'm looking at Matt Valley's record, and like his biggest win is uh, UFC reject Will Chope, aka Wife Beater. I think he's. I think he was the Wife Beater. Got discharged from the military for like, or for the Air Force for something. If I remember, it was a name like that. If it's not Will Chope, I apologize. Um, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the fact that Takashi Sato is just not, not very good. Garimba, not very good. Taking Sato by decision. Not looking forward to the fight. Complete even money fight. I don't know. That's bad. Uh, anyways, check out my Discord. Check out my Twitter. Check out the links in the description wherever it happens to be. On Acast, Spotify, Encore, and YouTube. And I'm looking at another one. There might be another platform coming up. But, um, yeah. There's a... There, <laughs> There's your prepper for this card that I, if you, if you have something better to do on a Saturday, go do it.